episode 304. Well, I think if you want to sell more batteries, you have to test more batteries. And, and I think battery testing isn't done near enough because people don't think about it. It's not top of mind like maybe an oil change is. Welcome, aftermarketers, to Remarkable Results Radio. Listen to learn just one thing from today's episode on your journey to remarkable results. Welcome, aftermarket professionals, to episode 304 of Remarkable Results Radio with another interview done at Apex 2017, and we're talking batteries. This episode is supported by Federal Mogul Motor Parts for serious technical training and support online, on-site, and on-demand. Garage Gurus is everything you need to know. Find out more at fmgaragegurus.com. I hope you get a chance to visit the episode show notes pages that are created for every episode. There, find the key talking points and additional bio information. You can find this episode's show notes at remarkableresults.biz slash e304. Hey, if you're listening on a PC, don't forget you can be mobile and listen on a podcast app. Go to remarkableresults.biz slash social to find many listening options, including my own app for the iOS or the Android platform. Hey, a shout out to my newest Facebook friends, Hans Jorgensen, Rhonda and Mike Wistens, Jim Wilson, Brock Coles and Trent Pickering, and new LinkedIn connections, Andrew Cutler and Megan Denoff. Welcome to the Aftermarket's Best Talk Radio Network. If you have an organization in need of a speaker to bring the pulse of the aftermarket to their next conference, just go to carmspeaks.com. There you'll find all about the three different speaking formats, my bio, and media kit download. Now, meet Michelle Zagola, the Director of Marketing and Communications at Johnson Controls, Jim Bates, the Aftermarket Training Center Manager also at Johnson Controls, and Patrick Haynes, Executive Director at the Responsible Battery Coalition. Now, we're talking the battery shop as an industry-wide site and as a resource. Also, the simple solution on how to sell more batteries. Also, how new DVI disciplines can help prevent your customer from not getting stranded. We also talk recycling and some astounding facts when it comes to being green on batteries. Enjoy. Hey, everybody. We're live at Apex 2017. Carm Capriato here with the Remarkable Results Radio Podcast. And uh, we've got some great stuff going on next to me in this in the uh, Let's Tech stage. But um, look what I was able to do corral in the studio here. Michelle Zagola, the Director of Marketing and Communications of North America for Johnson Controls. Jim Bates from Johnson Controls. Jim, you brought this thing together for me. Thank you. Well, you're welcome. The Aftermarket Technical Training Center Manager. And we couldn't talk about batteries unless we talked about recycling. So we were able to corral Pat Hayes, the Executive Director of Responsible Battery Coalition. Can't wait to hear about that. But first... Michelle, so you've got this great program for the industry, for the world, to really understand everything there is to know about batteries, and it's called the Battery Shop. Can you help me understand what that is? Sure. Two years ago, we created a YouTube channel called The Battery Shop, where we are posting videos, and Jim is really our expert on this, so I'd like him to come in on this, but he is our, we are posting how-to videos, fitment videos, fit, uh, battery technology videos, really anything about a automotive battery we are posting out there. Can the service professional in our industry value what's on the YouTube stuff? Oh, definitely. Okay. Definitely. There's so much happening in our industry right now. It's changing so fast. Like what? Well, so many of the car, the cars, there's hard to, the batteries are harder to find. Yeah, where are they? Where are the batteries, right? They're everywhere. Yeah, Yeah, they're everywhere. They're They're in the trunk. They're in front of the wheelhouse. Wherever they can find a place. Under the hood. Sometimes they're hidden. It's taboo, huh? Pretty much. There's no room. The technology is changing so much. There's so much more in the car. Start-stop technology. There's the car has so much more drain on its battery. The battery is much more important than it used to be years ago, and our site is helping the industry learn a little bit more about the batteries. So do you ever get a chance to sit in those, uh, like, 
meetings with the engineers trying to figure out how are we going to deal with all the changes that are going on? Well, so, well, I'll jump in there sometimes, but really what we get is a bunch of um, exceptions, they're called, from people who actually install batteries, and they say, this is really hard. Help us. How do we do this? Batteries are under seats. Uh, they're in the trunks. Um, they're uh, in the floors. And in some cases, a Cadillac comes to mind. We actually have to cut the carpet a little bit under the seat to get the battery out. That is an actually OE procedure. So people are kind of afraid, maybe the first time, to tackle a job like this. And so they can come to a resource like the battery shop and watch it being done. And so what we did is started with those exception reports that we got and, and created a list of difficult installs and we're kind of working our way through that. So the, the, so the professional customer who is selling your batteries, as an example, goes to your website and figures it out instead of trying to hunt and peck on his own. Or her own. Oh, sure. And that even uh, boils down to the guy at the dealership. Dealership mechanics, too. Uh, especially those that will serve as any kind of a vehicle. They may be factory trained on the cars that they sell at the dealership. But if one that comes in that they don't sell, that someone wants to buy a battery, they'll certainly take that job. But they may not know how to do it properly. And they can consult uh, that resource to, before they begin, just to see how the job is done. And, and that is one of the greatest things that uh, uh, we've been able to do is to answer for those people uh, th that question how do we do this I love what you told me a little earlier as we were kind of discussing where we're going to go with the interview that you would have instructors go on the site the battery shop to help in in student courseware we went to uh, NACAT which is the, where the instructors go every year for their in-service and things. Yeah. And I brought um, some of the uh, battery shop science and technology pieces that we put in there about how do batteries work and how are they constructed and, and what is absorbent glass match, you know, and things oh, like sure. that. And uh, the idea was that they could use this content that we provide uh, in the battery shop for their courseware. And as I was telling them this, I could see them in the back with their phones downloading these things as we speak. And so there's a lot of content on there for in automotive instructors as well. I think what you're telling me is there's a thirst of knowledge for understanding batteries, the installation of them. But this whole, the AGM that you just mentioned, where is AGM going? I, I think about a few years ago, I heard about it and I thought it was going to be a big wave. Is it, is it really, is it growing? It's really growing. It is growing. It is truly the battery that is growing because there is so many demands on the car now. There's so many electrical demands on the car. It's becoming a normal standard flooded battery is not an efficient battery to actually power your car. Pat, do me a favor. Hold that thought, AGM, because I want to I want to find out about recycling of that. Knowing that you're here, we're going to talk about recycling. So I, I want to reserve that piece for you. Uh, I, cha I chase these ideas. And so I have the luxury of being the host. Would you write that down? We'll get to it later. <laughs> so I'm in the battery shop. Do you help me understand how important it is to test the battery of every car that comes in for the customer? Do you, I mean, do you provide me tools and equipment. How do I sell more batteries? Well, I think if you want to sell more batteries, you have to test more batteries. And, and I think battery testing isn't done near enough because people don't think about it. It's not top of mind like maybe an oil change is. But if you're getting your oil changed, maybe if somebody were to check your battery at the same time, that battery would be tested on a timely basis like it should be. You know, in the digital vehicle inspection software today, I'll guarantee you that everybody, and they could choose what they want to put in it, but I'll bet you testing the battery is in there. And I just think because of the technology and software, just by default as the guys move to that level of customer service technology, it, more maintenance than repair, yeah. I'll, bet you, I'll bet you're going to start seeing that. I, I think you're right. And uh, as we, we have more and more uh, devices that rely on the battery today, uh, it's more important than ever to have this done. And, and if you don't, there are some systems like oh, Ford Motor Company, as an example, uses load shedding technology. And if you don't have enough battery to run all these accessories, the car just starts shutting them off on you. Now, and this is a little bit different than when the person says, well, I think I'll have my battery tested because 
because my car didn't start this morning or it started hard. It must be a battery. I think they'll notice that when things don't work anymore, they might want to look into that too. Infotainment, I thought of. Well, we, we'll shut down the tablet, the cell phone. How That's, about the heated seats? <laughs> oh my, how about the cooled seats? Stuff like that. <laughs> that's that's what load shedding's all about. Load shedding. Load shedding. You know, I've been around a long time. That's the first time I've heard that. But since I'm not in the tech and it's beyond my pay grade, thank you for teaching me that, Jim. <laughs> well, you're welcome. So when you're out in the field and you're talking to technicians, what do they want from a company like Johnson Controls to help them sell more batteries? Training, support. That's the it, big thing. Training and, support. training and support. Training and support. Yeah, because they know their trade. They know they understand their craft. What they need help with is the technology advancements that we have. Things, as you know, change so much. Um, I think that probably even testing of a battery, the algorithms have had to change so much in order to catch um, uh, problems in these batteries, which are high tech now. They're not like they used to be, you know, just a plain old flooded battery. Now we have enhanced flooded batteries. We have AGM batteries. And so even the testing of those batteries is different than it used to be a long, long time ago. You need help getting caught up with this stuff. I'm talking to Bud Houston, a technical product specialist with Federal Mogul Motor Parts. Do you actually put products in the hands of the technicians? Yes, absolutely. Anytime there's new product introduced, perhaps a new problem solver or a new technology, uh, we keep that stuff on the van just because uh, their local parts supplier may not have it available. And we think it's important to show them what's coming and then Seeing the part is really, especially with the new OEX, seeing the part and touching the part is something that that changes perspective rather than just a piece of paper with a picture of the part. Okay, so you put an OEX pad into the hand of a technician, and you've done this, I'm sure, hundreds of times. What do you see on their face when they see it? You can you can tell they get it. You know, in, in, in our industry, there's technology that, that we use all the time that you look at and you're like, that just doesn't make sense to me. I'm going to take your word that it works. You put an OEX brake pad in somebody's hand and I just ask the question, why does this look so weird? And they're like, I bet it's to make it cool. They get it as soon as you put it in their hand. So technicians holding your product and listening to your presentation, do you ever see the light bulbs go up? They raise their hand and says, boy, I've got a great idea for you. Oh yeah, absolutely. Not only do, do does that happen, Every time I'm with a group of guys, I solicit ideas. I'm like, listen, a lot of the stuff that I've shared with you originated in a bay somewhere where the technician said, you know what, if you could do this, it would be really cool. And so the stuff that I get, I send up you know, uh, to our engineering team and say, hey, could we do something like this? And there's things in, in the works and there's some things that came out recently that, that originated in, hey, if you could do this, it would be helpful because at the end of the day, you know, I think Federal Mogul is known in, in every line to be a problem solver and not just solving a problem, but making an installation easier as well. Federal Mogul Motor Parks' Garage Gurus is your go-to source for the vehicle training, technology, and answers you need to keep your next job on track. On site, online, or on demand, the gurus are here to help keep your business and your career on the road to success. Visit fmgarageguru.com. So here I am, a shop owner, and all this stuff is changing around me. I'm part of the battery shop. Do you have a learning management system for me that I could sign on and be sure that my techs are getting this training so that they know the differences in how to test? We do not I we do not have that right now. That's actually a very good idea. But many of our (laughs) many of our customers do have that also in their internally within their own for their their technicians but for those maybe smaller shops that's a very good idea what are the challenges that is a director of marketing you come up with in order to sell more batteries well, I mean, truly, honestly, training is one of the biggest things. So what's the training program? Here I'm, I'm, I'm a service advisor at Tech at a Shop. And, and Jim, you walk into my store and you say, Carm, you've got to have some training on batteries. And I go, that's like trying to teach me how to be, to, to, to sell oil changes. Come on, Jim, batteries? Well, I think it, it, it just depends on the segment of the market that we're talking about. So as an example, uh, there are a lot of uh, automotive retailer uh, out there that sell parts across the counter. And uh, our company and many other companies have 
trainers or representatives that are responsible for a geographic area of these stores, and they may come in uh, to help with their battery assortments or keep things up to date, but at the same time are able to train those peoples in the store and even their customers, you know, the old-fashioned clinics that are, are held after work hours where they get the techs together and, and talk about the latest technology and the latest test procedures. And so that training uh, can be done at the local level by uh, what we used to call factory reps, I guess we still do, uh, field representatives. Um, and also, there are lots of train-the-trainer programs, like the NACAD for the schools, and um, uh, training uh, uh, a company's technician who will be responsible for training all the other techs in that company. So it depends really on the, uh, the account. It depends on the level uh, uh, of uh, distribution that you're talking about. So training really exists uh, everywhere in all different forms, as I said, depending upon uh, the level of distribution that we're talking about. Okay, so here's my takeaway from our interview. T squared. Training and testing. Okay? Training and testing. It's another great idea you can It have. is a good idea. It's a really that. good idea. We'll have, to, okay. we'll have to copyright that one. Okay, I will. Yeah. <laughs> Trademark that logo. And I'll call yeah. my lawyer right now. Let's do this. I love it. <laughs> Pat Hayes. Yes. Thanks for being here, man. Thank we, you. We, were, we hunted all over Apex floor, <laughs> a million square feet, square feet, and we had to go find you to bring you in here to talk to you. Responsible Battery Coalition. You're the executive director. It was Mr. Bates who told me before you walked in the room that 99% of batteries today are recycled. Right. You asked the question, which, which actually was a really good question, of where are the batteries? And uh, that's, that's kind of the basis for what the organization is. And it's not where are the batteries today, but where are they going to be in 5 and 10, 20 years? Because, as Jim said, today's batteries are recycled at 99%. And that's really the best recycling rate of, of anything, right? I mean, of any it beats consumer plastics, product. it beats... Of it, truly it, any mean, consumer product. Any consumer product. So it, as it, part of what your job is as this coalition is not only to continue continue what's going on today, but to look down the road and say, as we, we shift on how we sell and buy our batteries, we've got to capture every outlet. Yes. You know, we've got to we've got to find every battery. We've got to go to every local municipal municipal dump right. and get this stuff. Right. right. So, so two points on that. So, for the for the the lead acid batteries today, the ninety nine percent, the one percent that's not recycled represents about two million batteries out there. They're sitting in houses and garages and basements, and so we want to recapture those and get those back into the recycling stream. But what we what we really want to do also is for all these new technologies that are coming out, lithium ion and others, nobody really knows what the end of life looks for those. And so we want to create a recycling system that's similar to the lead acid where we can get 99% of them or 100% and get them back and figure out how do we recover value so that it's economically viable to do that. Right now, recovering the cores for the lead acid makes, makes battery recycling you know, viable, and, and, and that's what's driven the 99% rate. When you, when you look at the new chemistries, it's, it's less clear where the value is in terms of the recovered materials. And so that's going to be a large focus of the organization is how do you make recycling economically viable so that you can get as high a recycling rates. Okay, so I think of smelters, and uh, they're, they're taking these batteries in. I mean, does every company have a smelter, or are there independent uh, recyclers out there? Well, the, the smelter, well, it's, it's, it's both. Okay. It, it works right, it's, both, it's both. Ways, yeah, yeah. And are they, are they recycling 100% of that core? Yes. Yes. Plastic, the lead. Plastic, everything. Yeah. Everything. So the, the entire battery today, the lead acid battery, is, is recycled. And everything can be used. And everything can be used. Over and over again. Right. Right. All right. goes back right. to my question about AGM. How about that? Is that recycled? My understanding is that, that it's, it's the same, it, that everything is, is reused. Everything and, is the same. the same. Now, if an AGM comes into a smelter, and I know this is a way high-tech question does it go into a different line or is it dump in with everything same else line. Same, same line same line so they're all crushed the lead falls to the bottom the plastic floats they get separated the acid they drain it they separate the acid from the water and the acid is actually dried up and resold as sodium sulfate and um, the, the plastic cases are recycled and then reuse to make new plastic cases for the new batteries. The lead is recycled. Jim, are you old enough to remember taking a five-gallon pail of 
acid and filling up a dry battery. Carl, you know I am. <laughs> <laughs> it's and, so, and, and, and that's that's the way it was done I for know. many many years. And, and so many so many of my listeners would say, what was he talking about? Yeah, I remember the day of how many genes I ruined because of the splatter. That's that's part of the challenge is with these new technologies. If there's not a, a viable path to recycle, you're not going to be able to throw them in the landfill. I mean, those, those days are gone, right? And so you have to find some outlet, some solution to get those to get those things recovered so that they're not being dumped, uh, you know, illegally or improperly. So the Responsible Battery Coalition is this made up of manufacturers, suppliers? Who's in it? Yeah. So we want everybody really in the whole supply network to be involved. And so we want man- manufacturers, we want retailers, we want major users for that. And so we want everybody that's involved. And so the, the, right now our membership, you know, is, is we're new, we're a very new organization, but we're including everybody in that entire network. And, and we're not just focused on recycling. I do want to make that point. We're looking at the entire life cycle. So there are issues related to the extraction of lithium and cobalt in, in, in countries for these, for these new technologies. And and nobody has nobody's addressed those issues in a in a real good way and so that presents a lot of liability so you're not just automotive it's no 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 exactly we're we're looking at um at, at transportation uh stationary and industrial um uh energy energy storage devices you mentioned that one percent they're in homes they're in how many are in dumps and landfills and rivers too many too many. In fact, one of the organizations, one of our partners, uh, is an uh, organization that cleans up rivers. His name is Chad Pogracki with Living Lands and Waters, and he, he's a fascinating guy. Um, he spends about nine months out of the year living and working on a barge where he's, he cleans up America's rivers. And one of the things that he finds are batteries that have, that have been dumped. And so we're working with him trying to spread the word of you know, get these things back into the recycling stream where they where they where they should be, so that they're not littering you know the banks of rivers or you know presenting different exposures. And I think a lot of it is communicating the message for you know the the the, the, the resident that you can get money by returning the battery. You know, I'm so happy you came uh, to the show today because you know when we sell a battery in a shop and it sits on the side and our supplier takes it because there's usually a core value on it and we say bye to it. It actually has another life. And I guess we should be happy and proud that we are doing this level. I mean, I know we're we're trying to recycle plastic bottles, you know, crazy. But boy, there's an awful lot of work to get that nickel back, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, the, it, I mean it, it, it should really be congratulated to the industry that lead, lead battery recycling is unparalleled in terms of, of you know, other, uh, other commodities that can be recycled in the U.S. How long ago did the, did the real big push for recycling start? Has it been at least 15 years? You probably have a better sense. I think it goes back far. I think it goes back into the 60s um, when, when there really was a... Uh, a realization that that there's an economic driver to get these things back. Plus, you don't want these just in, in the environment with yeah, unnecessary. Well, uh, but exposures. I remember I'm, I've been around a long time that we would just take the cores and put them on a pallet somewhere and then take them to the to the junkyard. Yeah, and yeah. And, and, I, and again, I believe they were working with recyclers, but it was there was almost a moment in time that someone interrupted that that process, and the battery supplier basically said no. It's coming back to me. And they found that level of responsibility to get it to the proper place, which would be to the smelter. There's also been a lot in, in terms of the process for, for smelting to make sure that there are no emissions coming out of those uh, smelters. Zero facilities. emissions smelters. Yeah. And, and that, the industry went through a tumultuous period, I'm going to guess maybe a dozen years ago, getting compliant. Right. These smelters having to you know, make sure that they were buttoned up. And in some companies, I, I, I think they got completely out of that business. And so yeah. g- good to know. Good to yeah. know. Thank you, uh, Pat Hayes, for being here. Jim, for bringing this and putting this together. Jim Bates, the aftermarket technical trainer and manager for Johnson Controls. And Michelle Zagola, director of marketing communications North America for Johnson Controls. I learned something. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. 
Thank you, Michelle Zagola, the Director of Marketing and Communications at Johnson Controls, and Jim Bates, the Aftermarket Training Center Manager from Johnson Controls, and Patrick Haynes, Executive Director at the Responsible Battery Coalition. I learned a lot. I learned some new things. That's the whole point of the podcast. Hey, use this interview to help you grow your battery sales. Thanks for being on board to listen and learn from the premier automotive aftermarket podcast. Until next time...